adab namaskar and hello to every one of you aap sab ka khair maqdam hai hamare is aasha ganga jamni online series ki aathvein program hai uh today we are going to discuss a topic uh, which uh transcends history and literature in our first series we had uh professor asim siddiqui from the department of english aligarh uh who had talked to us on literature as a window for history historical documents and for that matter historical sources exist in many forms the traditional archival sources such as official documents newspapers correspondence and diaries can be supplemented by personal archives oral histories and even works of fiction in order for historians to illuminate the past literature as history offers a critical new path fiction non fiction and autobiographical literature uh, can sometimes reveal even more about ordinary people's lives such an approach can yield personal insights into historical events that more formal documents sometimes omit lending insights into such diverse issues as gender identity multi- multiculturalism sexuality and the concerns of the working classes novels too provide a glimpse of the opinions of contemporaries which cannot be captured from facts and figures in fact they are also powerful opinion formers capable of generating perceptions that last over successive generations today we have professor raza meer who will talk on delhi and the literary challenges to create the delhi of a of 19th century its society its culture in fact its history raza meer saab is a professor of management at william patterson university in new jersey he has written several books and papers on management the most recent of them being philosophy and management studies a research overview which was published by routledge in june 2021 he is interested in urdu poetry and his latest book ikbal poet of the east will be published soon by penguin india his novel murder at the mushaira chronicles 19th century delhi in a fictional setting he has a phd in strategic management from the Uni- university of massachusetts a pgdm from the indian institute of management calcutta and a be in bio- biomedical engineering from the college of engineering usmania university hyderabad professor raza has won many awards for his teaching and scholarship welcome professor raza meer your book murder at the mushaira has been read by almost all of us 
Dear friends, let us hear him on the topic of the day, Recreating 19th Century Delhi, a Literary Challenge. Professor Beach. Thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction, uh, Professor Razvi. I am very thankful to all of you that you have given me a chance to listen to me on Saturday evening. I will do most of my speaking in English and I will beg your indulgence by way of setting the mood to read about a page and a half of my novel. Uh, this is somewhere at the later stage of the novel. Uh, the chapter is called Late Afternoon Everywhere, 9th May, 1857, 4 p.m. Fire, when doused by water, emits a hiss. A sigh can't be stifled when one is helpless. The Muazzin sounded the call for Asar prayers. On the face of it, it appeared that there was nothing particularly exciting on Delhi's schedule as it prepared to settle in on a Saturday afternoon. But the calm was deceptive. The city was a churn of bustle and action. It was going to be yet another of those incessantly busy nights Delhi was famous for. Several religious activities were occurring simultaneously. The Neeli Chhatri Mandir was conducting a recital of the Hanuman Chalisa to be followed by an Aarti and Mahaprasad offering. Gurudwara Rakab Ganj was holding a Sodar Di Chauki. The mellifluous recitation of the Rehras would be replaced by the Kirtan Sohila, which was some time away. St. James's Church was holding a series of non-Eucharistic services, such as healing prayer groups, choir recitals and Bible study. A parade of well-dressed men and women, European as well as native, could be seen walking into its porticoed pouches, porch, porches. In Hazrat Nizamuddin, the traditional Khawali program was scheduled. The devotional intensity of the attendees attend, tended to increase when Eid came close and continue until the Urs of Amir Khusrau to be observed 18 days later. In the masjid e tawheed there were more solemn Ramzan associated activities, which would conclude with the reading of the Tarawi prayer later in the night. Non-religious activities that night in the walled city alone included six weddings, four housewarmings, three Namkaran ceremonies, and of course, Mufti Azurda's Mushaira, which was to be scheduled, which was scheduled to commence immediately after the Maghrib prayer two hours away. The preparations for the events could be seen from the road across Mufti Sahab's house, which was a block away from the Fatehpuri Masjid. Servants bearing leather water bags were sprinkling the road so they could sweep it without raising clouds of dust. On both sides of the street, ornate lanterns were being set up to be lit at dusk. Inside the compound, one could see the final touches being put to the raised dais on which the poets would be seated. The fragrances of ghee, roasting meat, and caramelizing sugar intermingled in a corner of the compound, driving pious fasters mad. Everyone bustled about, finishing the chores of the day and getting ready for the events of the night. Just another event type in the greatest city in the world. However, the carefree air of the evening was in many ways a facade. This was not just a city of piety and gaiety. In fact, the predominant emotion in Delhi these days was fear. This inchoate and amorphous fear infected everyone. The Mughals and the British, the citizens and the migrants, the conscripts and the courtesans, the indebted and the creditors. None could give it a name but the ground under their feet felt as if it awaited a tembler of horrifying intensity. The human scape of the city was not a solid mass, but a veritable archipelago, with most of its island infected with pestilence. Of sorrow, fear, tension, despair, enemy, 
the claustrophobia of those shackled by bad relationships and the loneliness of those that were free of them. I just wanted to put that out there because that is one of many passages in uh, my book which foregrounds the city. Uh, as uh, Professor Razvi mentioned, I am, I am originally from Hyderabad. Uh, I am distanced, I am doubly alienated from Delhi, uh, both by space and by time. I grew up in Hyderabad. To me, Delhi was just a uh, sort of an idealized place. And when you go there, of course, sometimes I, I used to go there for work and really encountered a very different kind of Delhi. Uh, and of course, we are in the 21st century and to imagine the 19th century, one has to do a lot of uh, reading, one has to do a lot of uh, understanding of historical texts, political texts, as well as uh, hopefully uh, the literature of the time. And I'm here to share just a little bit with you. Shagutta, if you, whenever you have a moment, you can just uh, sort of put, uh, yes, uh, so this is my, I, I chose this topic because it was for me a literary challenge as well as a personal challenge. Uh, I have had the honor of speaking to the Ganga Jamni uh, heritage uh, uh, about a few months ago and I discussed many of my motivations for uh, writing my novel which I won't uh, revisit. But uh, having set my novel in uh, 1857, I really wondered what Delhi was like. So if you could give me the next slide, we will see that uh, Delhi really uh, represented uh, to us uh, an era of great grandeur. Uh, the buildings there, uh, even the ones that have survived, give a hint that it was architecturally and also in terms of its layout an incredibly uh, should I say unique place uh, on your right side, you see the Jama Masjid on the left and on the right side, one of the surviving rooms of the Khilai Mawalla, the Red Fort. But then we also uh, understand that the aftermath of 1857 uh, was, one, was a very, very violent period uh, in uh, Delhi. So in the next slide, we will see that uh, the representations of Delhi by, uh, you know, artists uh, spoke of murder, of suffering, of people being blown up by uh, being tied to cannons. And uh, that entire imagery is there. So both these sets of imageries are rather, uh, if I may say so, lurid. And they are both correct. But there is also a Delhi that lies in the middle that needs to be excavated. When we go to poetry, when we go to poetry, we find that every poet, particularly in Urdu, uh, has written about Delhi. One of the, uh, uh, on the next slide, I have just two Ash'ar by uh, poets. Uh, the relatively contemporary poet uh, Bashir Badar writes there, Ke dil ki pasti purani dildi hai. Again, be the imagination of somebody who lives in the present. And there are similar uh, sort of, uh, should I say, laments by people even preceding my era. Mir Takhimir, of course, lived in the 18th century and he says, Delhi mein aaj bheek bhi milti nahi unhe. Kal tak tha kal talak dimaag chinhe tak to taaj ka. And Ghalib, who is the protagonist of uh, my novel, has written several th uh, lines about Delhi in a similar lament, uh, in a similar uh, mood. Uh, for example, he said, Kuch yakhi, kuch guman ki dilli, anginat imtihan ki dilli, o be zabani ka ho gai hai shikar, asadullah khan ki dilli. This is a uh, uh, not unpublished uh, share of his, which appears in some of his Khutut. Uh, and while chronicling the uh, 1857, post 1857 landscape, he had said, uh, Chalk jisko kahe wo hai, ghar bana hai, zinda ka, is tarah ke 
if this is a meeting then how can you ever you know forget the the pain of separation so i was getting a lot of literary insights from characters that would be inhabiting my novel so i went a little further in, if you could show me the next slide and i came across this idea of the sambhala now delhi as we all know uh, because of its location its locus and its uh, significance in the indian uh, in the history of a variety of empires uh, was subject to periodic looting and was the site of many a battle uh, was the prize of many a battle uh, but it so happened that for about two decades or so there was an extraordinary uh, peace in delhi so there is this mythical concept of the sambhala where uh, a sick person just before dying becomes lucid becomes lucid and people remember that oh they became they started talking about various things and then they passed away you often hear that in a variety of cultures so people have referred to it as the lika sambhala this period now uh, after the marathas were kind of defeated by the british uh, the the an administrative quietness came over delhi and then there was a bit of a uh, should i say succession dispute after the death of akbar the second and uh, bahadur shah zafar ascends the throne in 1837 it the british were made it very clear to him that you can be the you know sultanate uh, delhi but you really do not have any administrative responsibilities we will give you a certain amount of money and you can conduct your court but you will not be making any decisions of consequence now the british were setting up their own uh, rule with a level of efficiency that characterizes characterized colonialism while bahadur shah uh, who was a person of letters was encouraging arts and uh, culture in his uh, court as a result of that uh, it was a very peculiar thing that everybody was i mean arts were uh, at their peak there was music and there was uh, poetry and the a certain affluent class of delhi intermingled in a culturally you know codified ways that were almost comical in terms of how much at odds were there with the rest of india this is pretty much what we associated with uh, associate with the idea of a gilded age in the united states in the early 20th century we see something similar when the society becomes super unequal and before the wages of inequality come and hit the upper class everybody is you know mannered very well mannered in that society and ghalib existed in that particular uh, should i say society although he was always an outsider looking in because he wasn't personally wealthy himself and there was always a sense of dread there too because people knew that this would not be able to last so i was able to understand that through an understanding of a variety of texts so in the next slide i really talk about some of the places from which i uh, drew inspiration i drew inspiration principally from history and from uh, from you know geography as well and we'll come to that but we come to history first so uh, and also political economy so as far as history is concerned we do know that the british ruled india even at that time from calcutta calcutta was the place where the governor general had his uh, court uh, they were rapidly moving southward and westward so they had a presence in bombay they had a presence in madras they had a presence in delhi and you know 
the princely states in the middle that ruled the country, they had all manners of arrangements with them. But they were in a hurry to, you know, get rid of the middleman, so to speak. And so one of the things that was enacted by the colonial administration and administered principally by Lord Dalhousie was the doctrine of lapse that basically said that any princely state where the king died without a male heir would be taken over. And uh, Jhansi in 1854 was the most uh, egregious case of them taking it over. And of course, they took over Awadh from Wajid Ali Shah well before he passed away. Awadh was the most, uh, should I say, prosperous province in all of India at that point in time. The second thing is that there was this great game that was going on. The three powers, England, France, and Russia, were engaged in some Cold War uh, machinations. And really, for some strange reason, historically specific reason, Afghanistan became the place which all three of them sought to control. And all three of them were present there in one way or the other. The British had... Uh, the inside track, as it were, because they were able to send supply lines through the Indian subcontinent and all that was being coordinated by Delhi. So Delhi was becoming more important to them. Uh, and it was only a matter of time before they would shift their capital from Calcutta to Delhi. Uh, there was, of course, the famous or infamous Enfield rifle issue. Everybody is aware of that. The shortest way I can put it is in 1856, they asked the entire Indian army to start using the 1853 uh, Enfield rifle. Uh, the, the way the rifle worked was that the, it had to be, the, the powder had to be released by, by biting the cartridge. And of course, there was a rumor that the grease uh, which was there on the cartridge was made of animal fat, which the Indian soldiers were very uh, reluctant to use and the British uh, disastrously miscalculated uh, the objections. Uh, the objection was not just to the rifle, we have to understand that. The objection was to the fact that every time these guys would get new rules and they would force people to do it and they would punish very bitterly anyone who, uh, you know, did not follow the rules. Uh, there was no discussion. It was uh, a very, very autocratic system, and the Enfield rifle was a very uh, big hot button issue. We should also not discount the fact that Enfield was a multinational corporation, and they must have put tremendous pressure on the East India Company to buy their material. So this is a classic example of political economy entering the realm of history. So I'm sure that palms had been greased, people had been uh, bribed, and the adoption of the Enfield rifle by a uh, army as vast as the East India Company's army involved a lot of money and a lot of commission was at stake. Uh, in terms of the relationship, the cultural relations between uh, the whites and the non-whites, the earlier, the erstwhile uh, British administrators, uh, let us not uh, overemphasize this. Not all of them were like this, but some of them were sympathetic to the uh, local customs. They had within them the wherewithal to uh, appreciate it. And they began to, uh, you know, not just appreciate, but sometimes adopt the functions, uh, the, the traditions of the uh, locals. So we have the example of people who began to dress in kurta pajama instead of their traditional western attire, the people who began to, uh, you know, learn Urdu and recite poetry and develop a takhallus and all that. At some point in time, the uh, clergy that dominated the East India Company's upper echelons decided that's not a good thing. We have to get rid of this. We have to stop this. We have to nip this in the bud. So they came and kicked out all the so-called white morals and really put in people whose uh, primary mode was really proselytizing. And that led to a little more cultural alienation. And like I said, the Mughal court, having nothing better to do, 
developed its fun its protocols even more uh, uh, you know should i say formally so all this was going on and if you read my book uh, you will find that i have incorporated this some place or the other let us now discuss the political economy of uh, the sort of indo gangetic plain at that point in time so in the next slide i have just put in a little uh, a few points which are you are all very familiar with uh, i am conscious about the fact that i am speaking to trained historians for which i you 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 have grown up reading a lot about this but i like to uh, present it this way the tax regime became dangerously efficient uh, it was not to say that there was not exploitation before uh, the colonial administration came in uh, it was there it was rather uh, heterogeneous but when it was bad it was terrible uh, but there were certain built in protocols jaise ki agar barish nahi hui to lagan maaf kar di jati thi simple thing like that but if you start using ledgers if you start putting double entry account keeping and if you say okay this uh, year we got this much lagan and now next year we are going to increase it by 3.5% or 7.2% or whatever it is now everything be begins to get codified everything begins to get accounted for and the fact that the rains failed is no longer an excuse and what the colonial administration basically did was that they told the local rulers we need this much from you and we don't care whether you collect more and uh, you know use it for yourself or something like that so each person became unaccountable to the to the class below them they became accountable only to the class above them as a result of that the tax regime became what i call dangerously efficient the british got what they wanted the nobility perhaps got much of what they wanted and the peasants starved literally starved and the level of extraction therefore increased you're not aap na sirf aapke jagirdar ko paal rahe hain lekin aap apne mansabdar ko bhi paal rahe hain aur aapke resident ko bhi paal rahe hain and then how do you how do you discipline quote and quote how do you get money out of them so you basically send the soldiers after them the same soldiers by the way who you had been beating up in the barracks now you have to understand that soldiers don't come out of nowhere soldiers come also from the peasantry so you are essentially asking them to uh, beat up their cousins uh, you know take their uncles land away and so on and so forth they right? created a lot of uh, tension within the social fabric and slowly of course uh, we were transitioning as a society from one mode of production to another from feudalism to it wasn't just capitalism because capitalism was being enacted somewhere uh, back in the united states but certainly if we may use language of the 21st century india had become uh, implicated in the supply chain for capitalism that the raw material that was needed to keep those mills humming was coming from here and so all manners of production and shipping and work became routinized and as we all know those of us who have read any uh, sort of uh, political economy issues uh, routinization leads to a tremendous amount of alienation uh, where the worker is really uh, you know delinked from the conditions under which they work so this was the political economy side and finally i just wanted to take a little bit of time this is less uh, uh, should i say theoretical but it's also very important geographically uh, for, for the novel that i want to talk a little bit about geography so what i put there in my next slide is a little google map of how you would travel from say mehroli to the red fort it says that in a car uh, given current traffic it'll take you 34 minutes i don't believe that for one second probably it takes 2 hours uh but let's just 17.3 kilometers which is a little more than 10 miles 10 miles really covers 600 plus years of history 
Delhi is almost like an onion to me. Again, this is, uh, this is a fantasy of somebody who doesn't live in Delhi. So on the north side, you have the, where Mehroli is, really you have Qutub Minar, which was built in 1190. And on the other side, uh, you have the Red Fort, which was built in 1638, but at the point uh, 1857, where my novel is, uh, it's still around. So this is the 700 years of history. Hai, wo isi little strip mein aapko nazar a jati hai, geography wise. You have Sri Fort, which was built by the Khiljis in the 14th century. Hauz Khas, hauz Alai, which was there principally to, there's no house there uh, now, of course, but at least the name of the Mahalla is there, which was there to provide water to, those, to the fort. And then, you know, you have the Lodi garden there, uh, depicting Ibrahim Lodi and Sikandar Lodi and that entire family. And then, of course, you have uh, Nizamuddin Darga, which is back at the, close to the Red Fort, and so on and so forth. So all these, in, in this little, should I say, strip of land, I found enough monuments that I could use to identify and depict 19th century Delhi. So if you take the next slide, I have there uh, our a few of the locations. There's of course the Metcalf House, built by uh, uh, built by Theo Metcalf, no, or John Metcalf, and Theo Metcalf is really the man who is inhabiting it in my novel. It was a beautiful house. It was, I think, called Dilkusha at that point in time. Again, the white Mughals, they gave their own name, a local name to uh, the monument. And on the right, you have the Sabdar Jang tomb, a very, very, uh, should I say, uh, striking piece of architecture, uh, made even more striking by the fact that this man, Mir Mukim, who is known as Sabdar Jang, was not really from Delhi. He really was uh, an administrator from the Awadh region who really represented the Mughal Empire, but actually under his uh, advice, the Awadh Empire delinked itself from uh, Mughal uh, rule and the Nawabs uh, of uh, Awadh began to call themselves, uh, you know, kings. So these are two very interesting, uh, should I say, uh, locations for me in the novel. And then the other two locations, which I just wanted to highlight, uh, the first one, uh, which is the tomb of Sarmade Kashani, uh, depicts the Sufi traditions uh, that were there in uh, uh, Delhi. There are several, there are several, should I say, Sufi saints that are very, very important. And many of them are also Shaheed in the sense they were killed by various people. In Agra, you have Nurullah Shustri, uh, popularly known as uh, Shaheed Esales, who was killed uh, by the Emperor Jahangir. Uh, again, for reasons, I mean, that had a lot to do with intrigue in the courts. And then there is this person, Sarmade Kashani, whose uh, grave is right next to the, or nestled into the uh, Jama Masjid uh, compound. And Sarmade Kashani was killed by Aurangzeb. And his story itself is fascinating enough to merit its own book. Uh, so I incorporated the story and the tomb of Sarmad into my uh, story. And uh, this is uh, Ghalib's home as it is now, you know, in 18, uh, in 1954, uh, in the 150th, uh, should I say, 150th anniversary of his birth, uh, the government of India put something together there. So I imagined and visualized Ghalib's uh, house in a particular way, although it might have been a lot different and a lot more modest when he lived in it. So uh, as you can see, uh, by using sources from history and from political economy and from geography, uh, and to the extent that I was able to look at uh, 
surviving uh, monuments, I was able to create locations in the novel. And then I produced a lot of characters and I list a few of them in the next slide, just a few. Uh, some of the characters that I have listed were historical. On the left side, you have a list of characters that existed in history. And on the right side, there are characters in my novel that I have invented. I put Zok and Dach together because uh, really to me, they represent uh, two shifting attitudes to Delhi with 1857 in the middle. Zok, as you know, Ibrahim Zok was the poet laureate of the Delhi Empire. And uh, at that point in time, the area of South India, particularly Hyderabad, Dakkan, was becoming very prosperous. And like a wannabe, like any wannabe, they wanted to lure him. So they offered him a lot of inducements. They said, we will make you the court poet of the Nizam of Hyderabad and we will give you a salary which is much more than any Mughal empire can give you and please come down. So he refused and his refusal was made, uh, made by way of a share which all of you perhaps are well aware of in dino garche dakan me hai badi khadre sukhan kaun jaye zok par dilli ki galiyan chhod kar and you know this really from my hyderabadi standpoint really you know it's almost like <laughs> makes me feel jealous what a beautiful way to describe delhi uh, subtly putting down the dakan but dag dag dehlavi who was born again and became popular in Delhi after 1857, did move to Hyderabad. Because after 1857, Delhi became untenable, especially for somebody who wanted to ply their trade as a poet. Ghalib perhaps was the only person who hung back and managed to eke out a living. Uh, the rest of them either tried their luck in Awadh or to smaller places like La Rampur, went down to Aligarh or to Hyderabad. And then Master Ramachandra represents to me the scientific temper of that time. Also Munshi Zakaullah. These are people who were professors, who were polymaths. Uh, if you read their history, you realize how much they read, how much they wrote, how much they translated. And their temperament was fundamentally scientific. Uh, they wrote tracts on mathematics and uh, so it just goes on to show that it must have been a very intellectually febrile time at that moment. Mohanlal Zuchi is another character in, in my novel but uh, as a historical character very fascinating. You know uh, of Kashmiri stock lived in Delhi uh, went to Afghanistan and engaged with the uh, East India Company in very particular ways. Simon Fraser was uh, the sort of administrator of Delhi at the time of 1857. Uh, people just before that, Octor Loney and others, were, uh, you know, more white Mughals. This is the time where everything shifts. People like Simon Fraser and Theo Metcalf really. Uh, identify more as uh, British and they begin to kind of, I mean, their their position to India towards India is ambivalent, but it ossifies and crystallizes into hatred after 1857. Umrah Begum is a very fascinating character, as you know. She was married to Ghalib for 60 years. She didn't really think very highly of him. And from what we understand, she was she represented the, the independence of women at that time. People shouldn't think of it, this as a time where only men were kind of uh, in the public sphere. And then I created a host of other, uh, uh, should I say, fictional characters in order to balance them out. But of course, the entire book is about one very significant character and for him I just have my own little slide and with that I will end that uh, Ghalib was such an interesting person. Ghalib lived at his time. Uh, 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 Ghalib was born in Mughal India and Ghalib died in colonial India 
and Ghalib used the postal system and Ghalib used the wireless and Ghalib traveled to Calcutta to ply his to 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 make his case in modern courts uh, Ghalib engaged with the Hindu uh, thinkers and uh, he was at the uh, forefront of debates between the Sufis and the Salafis. Uh, Ghalib was in Lucknow and he was, uh, you know, immersing himself in Shia culture. So as a result of that, he really comes, uh, he, he is drenched, in my opinion, in 19th century Delhi. So if you show me the last slide, this is where I would like to end. And all I would like to say about him is what he said about himself that uh, hai aur bhi dunya mein suhanwar bohat achche kehte hain ki ghalib ka hai andaaz e bayan aur i thank you very much for the attention that you have uh, with which you have listened to me and i would be very happy to take any calls that uh, or any uh, questions that you have but also if you have any uh, you know, feedback of your own where you want to discuss what you wanted to, uh, uh, you know, apne taasurat bhi bata sakte hain. And I really look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, many, many thanks for a very short, crisp, and very beautiful dis description of how uh, you wrote that novel, your sources, uh, your inspirations. Uh, your characters uh, remark. Uh, uh, before uh, uh, we start taking up uh, some of the questions which have been asked, uh, I would want to give some of my own comments. Uh, you know, you are dealing with 19th century days. Uh, which is supposed to be a period on which uh, much more is known than 18th century, the Dark Age. Uh, 18th century, the period when a large number of you know invasions took place from the soil of Delhi, massacres took place. Uh, the character of the, uh, the city itself changed due to uh, the attacks which were launched by the Abdali and the uh, But we are fortunate enough that for 18th century, uh, we have a very detailed, though once again, like your lecture, short and crisp, but detailed account. Murakai uh, Devi of Darga Kuli Khan. Like you, he was coming from Deccan. Uh, his home was Deccan. He came to Delhi, uh, visited it, like you did, and then he went back. Uh, we're not sure whether uh, his account, Murakai Devi, was started being written before the invasion of 1740 or after that, possibly after that. But it describes the social, cultural life of Delhi in, in very vibrant colors. I mean, if you have a story of Farsi, if you have a story of the original text, then you can see it. वैसे रजा साहब मैंने उसका फारसी भी पढ़ा और उर्दू भी पढ़ा और अंग्रेजी भी पढ़ा मुझे सबसे ज्यादा मजा फारसी वाले में आया फिर उर्दू वाले में आया अंग्रेजी में थोड़ा सा वो इंपर्सनल सा हो गया आई डोंट नो बट द वे दरगाह पुली खां वेंट ऑन टू डिस्क्राइब द गली स्कूचास स्ट्रीट कॉर्नर्स uh, the 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 uh, melas, the festivals, uh, the dargas, hmm. uh, you name it, his account has. Hmm. But, but 
in spite of that the name of the poets uh, the the the, the uh, you know not only poets but also marcia khwans hmm. um, uh, the moharram the holi the diwali hmm. the worst of various type of sufi saints uh, who inhabit the region of delhi and all of it gives uh, you know an impression about a very vibrant culture uh, which you know prevailed over the region of delhi now i was just wondering uh, after reading this text did this cultural uh, you know efflorescence because we historians say that when uh, you know political power declines the culture you know rises to heights so if this was the cultural efflorescence of an erstwhile capital during the 18th century what were the conditions which prevailed by the time that 19th century came was it the same type of culture which prevailed or was it something else which replaced it i am asking these questions in the sense that for the period for which you are writing your novel um, not only that period but from a little earlier period from 18th century onwards we start getting a type of literature which is known as shehar ashob literature hmm. lamentations as you sta uh, actually started your slides with lamentations about delhi hmm. uh, which now uh, does give us much information about the pinings of the inhabitants of delhi hmm. uh so i was wondering uh, when you wrote your uh, novel uh, how much of them did you invite number one uh, uh, secondly i was just wondering that you mention a lot of characters who are not mythical from 19th century delhi and you gave us a list of some of them starting with zauk and others ended up with ghalib i was just thinking why not mention uh, some others uh, for example sayyid ahmed khan uh, he was very active in delhi Uh, there was a uh, archaeology society of uh, delhi where uh, sir sayyid ahmed khan uh, was very active uh, very silently uh, carrying out with his surveys um, which ended up with asar usnadi yes a very important work uh, as far as delhi is concerned if we don't consider the whole of india and then his interactions uh with mirza ghalib uh and the fact that uh, he went to the delhi college but returned back in a half due to certain cultural uh, you know differences between those who were manning the college and the culture to which uh, ghalib belonged and then uh, ghalib telling uh, sir sayyid ahmed khan um, why write about history write about um, Uh, the uh, present rulers i mean uh, that that whole debate i mean that actually as a historian uh, as a novelist i don't know but as a historian uh, that would interest me a lot because mere khayal mein ye evidences milke ek bahut umda sa ek uh, uh, novel ka ek story ban sakti hai uh, i was just wondering why these things were not used uh, by you because they would have gotten uh, given us much more information regarding 19th century delhi i'm sorry i'm asking you these questions uh, let us start discussion in the meantime there would be other questions yes 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 thank you very much i mean i this is precisely what i was hoping for i was hoping to hear from other people as well uh dekhiye jahan tak sir sayyid ahmed khan ka sawal hai he makes a guest appearance in my novel and the guest appearance is as follows uh, i just followed the, how old people might have been at this point in time there are a lot of smaller for example uh, i brought anis and dabir from lucknow they happened to be visiting and they were at the mushaira 
and you had somebody like uh, munshi uh, naval kishore who was a, a young man uh, you know thinking of building a printing press and he happened to be at the mushaira likewise there was a 39 year old man named and there was also nasir ahmed the uh, you know khadus uh, type ke aadmi the wo wo bilkul matlab he he did not like mushairas he said he said they were kufr hai to wo bhi aake thoda you know these are all people in the background but there was a 39 year old sayyad ahmed khan who was also at the mushaira but left before the murder i just wanted to pay enough homage to all these important characters that were there uh he he did not you know how it is that there's a cutting cutting room and where things get cut so this kind of fight that happened between uh, uh sir sayyad ahmed khan and mirza ghalib uh, over the preface that ghalib had to write about his book uh, was there but uh, it was sort of interfering with the narrative but like uh, if you say that history is geography or geography is history then asar us sanadid is a very very important uh, uh, you know document that keeps delhi uh, alive and as you said is an interesting counterpoint to the shehra shob literature the shehra shob literature as professor razvi said uh, the kind of lamentations for a bygone era the uh, nostalgia uh, while it is very important while it is very important uh, tends sometimes to envelop and does not uh, provide good examples of the lived experience of delhi such as you might get from murakkai delhi of the 18th century or for that matter guzashta lucknow by abdul halim sharar which you know describe lucknow in similar quotidian detail you really want some quotidian detail uh, some day to day life stories uh, i went and i read a lot of urdu books uh, for example uh, giraftar shuda khatut uh, tarikh e bagawat e hind uh, uh, roznam che muasir e tehreer e yaddasht e delhi tarikh ke aine mein there are so many of them uh, fortunately the urdu the corpus of urdu literature on 19th century delhi is big is very big but like professor razvi said that shehra shob uh, sentiment uh, dominates and it's almost uh, as if these guys were working very hard to delink themselves from uh, political economy as if you know there was a it's like the sun rose and the sun set you know why did the sun set and what we understand is that 70 i call the period between 1707 and 1857 the long 18th century of urdu literature you know giovanni arigi had talked about the long 20th century historian to usi tarah 1707 aurangzeb died at that point in time the mogul empire was at its peak uh, certainly administratively and after that it began to disintegrate and 150 years later from 1707 1857 the mongol empire ceased to exist but it was a gradual you know things went down one of the biggest body blows to delhi of course is the invasion of nadir shah uh, which exposed the fact that the mongol empire was no longer something that the citizenry could rely upon to defend it right it was exposed in a in the way baghdad might have been exposed when halaku uh, you know uh, invaded so we knew that whatever future lay in store for india it was not a mogal future so at that point in time you know hyderabad uh, or rather the dakkan both mysore and hyderabad uh, moved away uh, awadh moved away uh, the marathas kind of moved away the afghans were never part of it and so slowly it began to get reconstituted and reformulated and the british who 
were surprised by their success at the Battle of Plassey in 1757. They had no idea that they would exceed their wildest expectations, began to see in a future for themselves in it. And so they were slowly setting things in place. Uh, they were incredibly patient. They became impatient later, but they slowly, you know, developed relationships here, uh, you know, kicked out the French from there. And, you know, a lot of colonial powers were eyeing India, how British took over. So all this was being played out, as we saw, I feel, in Delhi. It was being played out in such a way that even in the 18th century of Delhi, the Mughal Empire was more relevant than it was in the 19th century. Although people were making jokes much long before that, right? Sultanate Shah Alam as Dilita Palam. You know, that the, the man who calls himself the king of the world, he only rules from Delhi to Palam. And even that was you know, a generous uh, description, because by then, you know, Marathas versus uh, uh, British was really the dominant uh, conflict of the time. So, yes, so the movement from 18th to 19th century Delhi was very, very uh, significant. And from a literature standpoint, I mean, also historically, but from a literature standpoint in particular, we also see that the locus of, uh, should I say, culture was shifting towards Awadh. Nobody wanted to live in Delhi for two reasons. One is that it was dangerous. Two, there was no money there. And, you know, there was a lot of money to be made uh, on, in the courts of Awadh or even the smaller courts like, you know, Rampur or uh, Mahmudabad or places like that. So the eastward shift of culture was there and the westward shift of administrative power was there. Uh, so let us now have uh, some questions uh, for Professor Gu. Um, Muhammad Aftab Alam. This can be treated as observation come query. Besides 1857 revolt centric literature, which protects the political, social, cultural, and literary menu of 19th century Delhi, leaving aside your own latest contribution, it is Sankur Rahman Farooqi's Tai Chan Sare Asman, Parse to Parham, as the mirror of beauty in English, is most lyrical and naturalizing description of 19th century Delhi. It tries to present the political, social, and cultural menu of Delhi in the silence of the world. Yes. I, I would say that Kai Chante Sare Asma is one of the most significant pieces of, uh, it's certainly possibly the most significant pieces of Urdu fiction to come out of the 21st century, which is uh, still very young. Uh, but as a novel, it is fascinating. For those of you who have not read uh, Kai Chan Te Sari Asma, uh, it really, the, the central protagonist character there is a woman named Wazir Khanam. Uh, Wazir Khanam, it turns out, uh, is the mother of uh, Daag Dehlavi. And uh, she is the wife of, and she had, she had a few uh, relationships but one of her significant relationships was with Shamsuddin Khan, who was a uh, cousin of Mirza Ghalib. Both Shamsuddin Khan and Wazir Khanam have very, very minor uh, roles in murder at the Mushaira. But that book, Kai Chand Te Sare Asma, uh, is, you know, almost like a prose poem. It's a long book. And it has been translated, or should I say, transcreated by Shamsur Rahman Sahab into English uh, as Mirror of Beauty. Both the books were published by uh, Penguin and they are fascinating. They are fascinating historical records. And as you know, uh, 
marhum shamsur rahman farooqi sahab would have forgotten more about delhi than i can ever remember so usme jo detail hai usme jo detail hai wo to i mean it's very enviable it's very enviable uh, between you and me when i came across that book i just didn't want to read it before i finished my novel because uh, uh, i was worried that you know it would influence me uh, and it was just as well because you know after that you really feel oh my god uh, you know just as well uh, because his detail is very very uh, remarkable very remarkable i also want to say that uh, uh, ahmed ali's uh, book uh, twilight in delhi is a very good uh, depiction and uh, uh, you know it 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 is slightly later it's around the turn of the 20th century but it, again it has very beautiful sort of it's it's the dispirited part of delhi uh, after 1857 very beautifully described and there are a few other novels like this yeah thank you Uh, let us have a question by Ali uh, Achha Mirza Hussain. Okay, for Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan uh, Shah Alam II, it can be argued that he had nominal authority because coins of majority states of India were still minted in his name, and he used to give titles and fillets to his nobles. But does this nominal authority also existed with Mughal Emperor Akbar II and Bahadur Shah Zafar? or even their nominal authority was gone and they were mere sifo also in 19th century mughal delhi which state of south asia had most interest in doing alliance with mughals yes uh, thank you that's a very interesting question that's a very interesting question see the minting of coins as we all know is not just about uh, about you know creating modes of exchange but also putting your authority the reason why our currency notes work because the reserve bank of india underwrites them so was it there uh, it had long gone by the time bahadur shah zafar was in in power what they had was a ceremonial system in the ceremonial system they would make ashrafis ashrafis are gold coins now the value of the ashrafi would be there because of the gold that it was minted in but you imprinted the the king's uh, picture or the king's seal uh, in the case of the Mugh Mugh moguls it was called the sher o khurshid uh, there was a lion and there was a rising sun and so they had the sher o khurshid they would put there the british insisted in my opinion rather uh, you know it was a terrible thing to do that on the other side now you have to put the british authority so they were symbolically taking away even that authority from bahadur shah zafar uh and they had made a very clear internal decision that once bahadur shah zafar died uh, the mogal empire would end Uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar's youngest uh, wife Zinat Mahal was unaware of this and she had a young son and she was trying very hard to push him as i mean it was just titular but she wanted to him him to be the titular mogal but they had uh, sort of uh, decided internally so irrespective of when Bahadur uh, irrespective of uh, 1857 or not the mogal empire was going to be at an end as far as the south indians uh, i would say that uh, mostly it was the uh, the hyderabad the, the nizam of hyderabad uh, who wanted to have relations with the uh, moguls the moguls had nothing but they had a lot of uh, you know cachet on account of the fact that they had ruled india for 400 years so yeah everyone wanted to make some relationship with them but it mostly was about them giving and the mogul stake uh well uh, mirza hasan sahab i would like to add a little to what uh, uh rabi sahab uh, said uh i would like to remind you that at the time when uh, the 
revolt of 1857, the mutiny, the rebellion, uh, the first freedom struggle, whatever you call it, when it took place, uh, what was the perception of the common Indians as far as the Im Mughal emperor was concerned? Razami Sahib told you about what the Britishers were thinking to do with him after his death. But as far as the general Indians were concerned, it appears that they still continued to consider him to be the Padsha. If that was not the case, then why would the rebels from Merit and elsewhere rush to the fort of Delhi and force the old man to take up the leadership? The mere fact that they were forcing uh, an ill old man to be the leader showed that in the general perception of the people, he was still viable. Number, one. Number two, if that, if that was not the case, then why would Tatiya Tope or Rani of Jhansi or anyone else who revolted would take the banner of the Mughals over their heads. It was the Mughal banner which was the covering as far as all the sections of those who were revolting against the Britishers was concerned. So uh, uh, to give a short answer uh, to your query, Ms. Astan, uh, I think uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar may not be having any political power, but as far as his psychological control over the Indians was concerned, it was uh, quite great. And that is why most of those who rebelled against him, they used his name and, and, and the revolt of 1857 was fought under the peculiar <laughs> Bahadur Shah Zafar. The next question, please. There is a question by Ali Haider Saab. Professor Masood Ashraf Raja in his book, Constructing Pakistan, foundational texts and the rise of Muslim national identity 1857 1947 has argued that Mirza Ghalib's Dastan Goi, uh, a diary of the Indian revolt in uh, 1857, was the first politically conscious work in Muslim Indian history. Doesn't this diary show that Muslims were already politically conscious even before All India Muslim League? was formed in 1906. Thank you for that question. Uh, I do not know whether it's the first politically conscious work that's for historians to determine, but it was very politically conscious. Dastan Bui, for those of you who don't know, is a Farsi uh, uh, book that was written by uh, Ghalib in probably 1859, 1858, 1859 at that point. Now, you have to understand the circumstances in which it was written. The British had reconquered Delhi. They were savage reprisals against everybody who they thought was uh, uh, associated with the rebels. Many people, including several of Ghalib's poet colleagues, had been killed. And, you know, he might have wanted to lie low, but he couldn't lie low because his entire uh, mode of existing was to be a public figure. He needed a stipend. And so uh, he is writing, understanding that the British are going to be reading this. But at the same time, his sympathies lie with the rebels. And so it is a multi-layered manuscript. I have not read the uh, Farsi uh, original because I don't read Farsi, but I have read the Urdu translation and it is really very interesting that he has actually made a very good uh, 
should I say, accounting of British atrocities, but at the same time not revealed himself to be a rebel. And that is very true that it was a very politically conscious work. And I think that uh, the idea that, uh, you know, that Muslim Indian identity emerged after 1857 is laughable. These are all works in progress and they happen all the time. It's just like saying that the Indian national identity emerged after 1857. Uh, sure enough that, you know, there are certain uh, religious, uh, should I say, historical events that are impetuses to do that. But the, should I say, the groundwork for them is uh, decades and centuries in the making. So I agree with that point. Uh, uh, Rabi, uh, thank you very much. Um, 19th century Delhi के अलग-अलग aspect के बारे में रोशनी डाली और अपने किताब के बारे में भी आपने रोशनी डाली कि संदर्भ में आपने उसको take up किया what were the issues involved what were your sources उम्मीद करता हूँ कि इसी तरह historians literatures economists sociologists सब बिल्कुल के हमारे पास की स्टडी करें। You know, history is supposed to be the mother of all the sciences. Just to claim that to talk about the past is only the historian's job is laughable. I mean, yes, there are certain tools which the historian uses to make it rigorous. Uh, but uh, scholars of the other fields uh, uh, also contribute to the development of the knowledge of our past. Uh, unfortunately, as far as we historians of modern India are concerned, of the 21st century, let me say, uh, late 20th and 21st century, we have actually not paid much, uh, much attention to literature and culture. And uh, we have been uh, stressing more on other aspects. Uh, but I think that uh, the time has come for us to join hands and gain much more information from the various uh, repertoires which are, um, you know, uh, actually present and yet to be actually read by these concerned scholars. Razami sahab, bahut bahut shukriya ek aise aspect ko highlight karne ke liye jo aam taur se general historians ki nazar se bach jata hai. Shukriya. In fact, I would wish that in future also we would be able to host you on uh, a similar but different topic uh, because you uh, have to do but in spite of that you have done this and done this in fact the first time when I heard you uh, <coughs> uh, once again on a topic of culture religio-cultural topic uh, that was concerned with uh, commemoration of Muhazam. Uh, last year, uh, uh, at the online theater, and I was fortunate enough uh, to join and listen to what you have to say. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 friends, and next week, uh, we could once again be meeting at the same time. That is Saturday. 7 o'clock and uh, we would be having with us uh, Professor Shirin Musti. Uh, but Professor Shirin Musti this time would not be talking about, uh, you know, uh, about statistics or about economy of the Mughal Empire on which he has worked. Uh, uh, we will be having her for a discussion on a very popular book 
which she had uh, once spent in 1992, a very old one. Uh, episodes in the life of emperor. और वो जो एक पतली सी किताब जो किताब का फॉर्म बनी 1992 में वो एक साइक्लोस्टाइक डॉक्यूमेंट के फॉर्म में थी जिसपे ओरिजिनल पोस्टर्स को लेके ट्रांसलेट करके और एक जगह जमा किया गया था अल्टीमेटली इट वाज पब्लिश्ड इन इंग्लिश एंड नाउ उसकी रिलेवेंस आज आप पूछेंगे 92 में जो चीज हुई वो अब हम डिस्कस करने जा रहे हैं वो इसलिए क्योंकि तकरीबन हिंदुस्तान की हर ज़बान में उसका ट्रांसलेशन हो चुका है और इसके अलावा फ्रेंच और दूसरी ज़बानों में भी उसका ट्रांसलेशन हुआ एंड दैट इज़ व्हाई इट इज़ वन ऑफ द वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट इन बुकलेट्स फॉर अस टू अंडरस्टैंड दी पर्स नॉट ओनली दी पर्सनालिटी ऑफ अकबर बट आल्सो दी 16 17 सेंचुरी इंडिया सो नेक्स्ट वीक सेम टाइम वी मीट अगेन Thank you everyone for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon.